glad to be here here, share, uh, here sharing ideas with you. I'm an evolutionary biologist. A little louder. A little louder? OK, I didn't want to get too much of that feedback stuff. How's this? I think I'm just going to change the angle. All right. Good? All right. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and for most of the last 40 years, I've been thinking about ways in which evolutionary principles can uh, be used to solve medical problems. And typically what I've done is looked at what I think is the problem that could benefit most and worked on that. So I've actually been working on cancer for about the last five years and I'm particularly interested in breast cancer. Let's see, do I have a, is this my thing for, for changing? Or do I just, oh here we go, this probably, the green button means usually go. Um, okay, I'll get it there. Uh, now, what I like to do is to start at the most basic level because I think what often happens is we're, we don't make progress in an area because we sort of jump into some way of looking at the problem before we really understand the problem. And, and so when I'm thinking about cancer, whether breast cancer or other cancers, I want to start at the beginning. What causes cancer? And you'd think that we'd have a pretty good understanding of this. It, once we do have a good understanding, we should be able to figure out ways to block those causes and prevent cancer. So that's really what the goal of, of this organization is. And so I think that um, it's worth starting at this very basic question. The problem is we're o we only understand this, the, the answer to this question for very few cancers. Um, and I think part of the problem is we've been working under a uh, framework that probably is not the right framework, at least not a complete framework. This is illustrated in this diagram. This diagram just suggests the way that people thought about cancer for most of the last 50 years, which was just in terms of things that cause mutations, and mutations dysregulate uh, the ability of the cells to control um, them, themselves you control their replication, and so we get cells that have some, um, some sort of runaway replication. So the idea is basically some people may have predispositions to these um, mutations, but basically it's a series of mutations that eventually causes cancer. Um, but there's been a revolution that's been going on the last 40 years, and this revolution has been recognition that more and more human cancers are caused by infections. Now, people tend to sometimes dismiss this idea without really looking at the evidence. And they dismiss it by saying, oh, well, everybody's getting too uh, uh, excited about cervical cancer. But this table gives you a sense of, what, of what's been happening over the last 40 years. It's not just cervical cancer. It's a broad collection of cancers that we now recognize are caused by um, infections. And this is a little scary. We're now up to about 20% of all human cancers. Unfortunately, breast cancer is in the category of uncertain causes. But, that, but one of the exciting things about this very sort of paced revolution is when medicine finds that an infection, infection causes a problem, usually there's something medicine can do about it. Medicine is probably better at dealing with infection than almost anything else. And the greatest success stories in battling cancer have arisen from recognizing that certain cancers are caused by infection. So liver cancer, for example, now is readily accepted as caused mainly by hepatitis B and hepatitis C viruses. And we've, over the last we, meaning health sciences, has been preventing millions of cases of liver uh, cancer by blocking modes of transmission, making sure the blood supplies are not com contaminated with these viruses, and also by uh, vaccination. So this is kind of the background. Um, we recognize infection is important. People first started thinking, well, infection is just exacerbating the mutation-driven process. But another hypothesis here on the right is that infections actually acting much more fundamentally to uh, initiate the uh, oncogenic process. And that is, is, is a possibility that's particularly um, interesting and important because if infection is actually initiating the process, then if we prevent the infection, we're going to prevent the cancer. If it's just exacerbating the process, we might be able to do something kind of beneficial, but not, we're not going to get that decisive solution that this organization is after. This organization wants to be able to prevent cancer by 2020, which is a, is a tall order. But if we understand that there are weak links in the, um, in the oncogenic process, weak links for the cancer, then maybe this uh, we can actually move 
well towards this goal um, in this period of time. Okay, well, um, what we're really talking about is the interventions. We, we're interested in interventions to prevent or cure cancer. Um, and there are interventions that people have been looking at for a long time based on the conventional viewpoint, that is preventing mutations. A great example is getting people to realize that uh, stopping smoking, smoke is mutagenic, stopping smoking helps lung cancer, um, and ex reducing exposure to sun will reduce the mutation rate and, and help reduce uh, skin cancer. Um, preventing or curing infections is really probably what we're most concerned about with regard to breast cancer. And uh, this has been effective in terms of vaccines, as I mentioned, for um, cervical cancer and for uh, liver cancer. Um, curing infections also actually works for stomach cancer, for example. If you get the uh, early stages of stomach cancer identified, you can treat with antibiotics, get rid of the bacterium that's causing the stomach cancer and actually cure the cancer. So curing cancer, if it's caused by infection, is not completely uh, a crazy idea. Uh, but generally, people have been looking at poisoning fast-growing cells, trying to do this selectively, realizing that fast-growing cells are going to be more vulnerable to poisons that are compromising their ability to replicate than slow-growing cells. And we know the history of this. There have been some successes, but they're sort of, they're, they tend to be very arduous successes. Um, so most of the effort has been, in the last um, 20 years, has been trying to refine the sort of attack on cancer cells, targeting molecules to inhibit or kill cancer cells. And there are three basic uh, categories of targets that have been looked at uh, quite extensively uh, by MBCC in these past uh, summits and meetings. Uh, one is looking at the most obvious target, which is our cells are the molecules on cells that are overexpressed in cancers. These are normal molecules. Uh, another is looking at abnormal mutated molecules, and especially during this Artemis meeting uh, the last um, uh, two months ago, we were looking at um, the possibility of molecules of oncogenic pathogens. Now, these different targets have different pros and cons in terms of uh, the possibility that you're really going to get a decisive solution against uh, breast cancer. So we target overexpressed normal molecules, which is the kind of thing that, that I think people most quickly um, uh, focus on. We've got some problems because those normal, from an evolutionary point of view, we realize those normal molecules are there on cells because they're performing normal functions. And the fact that they're overexpressed on cancer cells doesn't negate their normal function. So if you target them, you're, you're likely to have some fairly profound uh, side effects. And these side effects are likely to be exacerbated if you're trying to use what we're calling prophylactic vaccines, vaccines that you're trying to introduce into people before the cancer arises. That's, in a way, that's sort of the ideal. You vaccinate with some, somebody against cancer and they never develop the cancer. This is what's been so, one of the things that's been so successful in medicine when in dealing with infectious diseases. One of the problems with that is that you're generating long-term responses, immunological responses against your own molecules. And so this, right from the outset, although these are interesting things to look at, we realize that there are some problems. And the kinds of evidence that we've talked about in the meetings suggest that these problems are arising in these kinds of approaches. So we always have to keep that in mind if we're thinking about decisive solutions to something like breast cancers. Um, and then the, the last point is a sort of subtle one. Generally, when we're looking at these molecules that are overexpressed on cancers, they're not essential causes. Remember when I talk, gave you that last uh, figure, I talked about infections as being possibly essential causes. To make a long story short, the evidence indicates that for all the infectious agents, all the viruses in particular, that are now recognized as cancer-causing viruses in humans, turns out they're essential causes that they are, what I mean by that is that they are actually getting the cancer rolling, and so that's very encouraging. And I, I obviously I don't have time to talk in detail about this, but we will talk about this in the workshop that I'll be uh, running um, right after this plenary session. Um, and so that's actually very encouraging that if, you, if you're thinking about how you could, you could actually vaccinate against a compound that would actually prevent cancer if it's not a part of the normal um, molecular makeup of our cells, then 
we, we have a chance to prevent the infections and thereby present, prevent the cancer. If we're targeting the normal cells, then we've got a long-term response that is likely to have side effects that will be um, lasting much longer than uh, chemotherapeutic targeting or, or what is sometimes used as uh, an antibody targeting of normal cells. Uh, another possibility, well, let's focus on uh, the mutations that occur in cancer. And this is uh, good in one sense in that it, it reduces the problems of side effects if you can actually target what's different about those mutated molecules. So we've, we've talked quite a bit about this. Um, one of the problems, you really have to direct your attack, let's say if you're making a preventive vaccine, against the mutated par part of the molecule. And one of the problems there is even if in, when you have a cancer that's a result of mutations in a particular gene causing a particular protein to change, the parts of the molecule that are mutated may be different. And so you're not, you're, it seems a priori that you're going to have difficulty in uh, getting a vaccine that's going to protect a variety of people against a cancer that, for which there's a mutated protein. If the mutations are in different places, you have to have different vaccines, perhaps, for different uh, people. Um, and then the other problem is that if you target uh, a mutated protein, because these mutated proteins generally are not essential causes, but rather exacerbating causes, it's quite uh, easy for the cancer to evolve in response to that attack evolve uh, changes in, their, in its biochemical uh, makeup so that it essentially escapes the attack. So the targeting of abnormal mutant molecules has its problems. And this then brings us to the, the molecules of oncogenic pathogens, which I've already said is if, if they're infectious agents that are causing cancer, this is a sort of tried and true way of solving a medical problem. So from my point of view, I think it's really worth looking at the evidence that suggests that infections may be playing roles in, in breast cancer, trying to figure out what are the weak spots of that infectious process so that we can prevent that. And starting perhaps very quickly, we can be preventing cancers and possibly curing cancers if we can figure out ways to attack those infected cells by targeting the infections themselves, which is something that we can, we can do in, in other kinds of infectious diseases. In this case, you have very little, very few side effects. You've got many unique targets that are different from human molecules, so you're not trying to attack cells based on human molecules. You're trying to attack cells that are based on um, recognition, based on cells that are carrying foreign molecules, and this is just the way that our immune system normally works. So you're trying to enhance the normal immune system. How am I doing on time? We've got five, just five minutes. five minutes. Okay, that's great. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's been proven successful. It's probably the I'm, I'm certain I would, I would be willing to argue with anybody that these are the greatest advances that have been generated against cancer uh, in the history of medicine uh, because they prevent, with very little side effect, they prevent uh, tremendous numbers of cancer. We're in the process of preventing them right now with uh, liver cancer and cervical cancer, for example. Um, so all of this, if we sort of go back to all this whole list of invent interventions, to me, the, the most um, promising angle is for um, looking at these two uh, categories I've highlighted here. If you prevent and cure infections, let's say finding out how infections are transmitted, and then if you, t in a therapeutic way um, or in a preventive way in terms of vaccines, you identify the targets uh, of your approach, focusing on molecules that are really not human. Okay, so in the last, we actually, uh, I think, really started addressing this question from a practical point of view in this, this last Artemis meet, meeting, which was just two months ago. And, you know, normally when we brainstorm at these kinds of meetings, you know, we often feel, oh, well, that's a great idea, and then you think about it the next day or a week later, you say, oh, and maybe it wasn't so great. But if you actually do come up with a really interesting idea, you think about it the next day and you say, that, yeah, I think that it was a good idea. And you think about it a week later, and you think, yeah, yeah that's a good idea. And begin, you begin to realize, well, maybe we really have something here. And I, I think that something came up um, in that last Artemis meeting, which is one, in that category of things that actually continue to hold up to uh, repeated scrutiny. And this was something that we developed in this small group, about four people, uh, four scientists. Um, and uh, the idea was that we now have kind of tool that we haven't had in the past. National Cancer Institute has invested a lot of money 
generating cancer genomes by taking cancers out and genoming or sequencing the entire genome with the idea that something good's got to come out of that. And there, I think we're thinking mostly that we're going to get a lot of mutations that may make proteins that are altered and we can target those mutated proteins. Um, but that, that information is there for 30 breast cancer samples. And this is a tremendous amount of information. We talk, we talk about human, human genome sort of glibly, but there are uh, 3.5 billion base pairs in the human genome. So if you think about a given base pair, a given bit of information as a sixteenth of an inch, and um, you think about how many bits of information you have to uh, collect in those, you're collecting those 30 genomes. Um, if you put those sixteenths of an inch next to each other and ask how far that would that go, that would go four times around the world. Okay, so it just gives you a sense of how much information is there. Didn't have the information just a few years ago. We've got it now. We also have genomes for all human viruses. So we were talking about the way in which you could actually very quickly find out what viruses are in the human breast cancers. Um, and by just intersecting the two bits of, uh, two batches of information. And this involves so much uh, computer time that you couldn't do it. You can't even really send it over the internet. You've got to go to the databases and download it all on fast computers. But we figured it actually is doable now. And so we actually we made a suggestion of what could be done. I talked with Fran a little bit uh, over uh, the internet uh, this last week asking, well, how, is this likely to be um, taking place? And, and the response was, maybe. It sort of depends on how much support there could be. It, actually, it's not very expensive. The expensive work has been done. It's just a matter, we figured it would be about $250,000, which is not expensive by, by uh, most of the measures of, of funding that we're ta we've been talking about, cancer research. But anyhow, what, what's nice about this is that um, uh, you'll be able, by doing this intersection, you should be able to see what viruses are in the cancers. And up till now, uh, we're talking, we've been talking mainly about a very arduous process of thinking about a virus, looking at samples, and, and trying to see whether that virus is there. A lot of misses, even when you get hits, uh, people try to replicate the studies, and, and people that are replicating may not find the same thing. Techniques might be different. Maybe the first uh, group of investigators was wrong. So it's, it, it takes a lot of time, but, but maybe essentially in this way we can cut to the chase and find out what viruses are really dealing with, because it's pretty clear. If infections are playing a role, important role in causing breast cancer, it's not going to be just one. Maybe, my guess, it'll be at least five or ten. But and they may be acting in concert. So in one swoop, you could actually find out what these uh, uh, viruses may be. But now we, as I'll talk about in this workshop a little later, now we're really beginning to understand what makes a virus cancer-causing. So as soon as we find these virus genomes, it, we can pretty much sort out which ones are bystanders, which versus which ones are playing a fundamental role. And once you understand the infections, then you have, you're right on, your, on the road to being able to figure out how to prevent them or maybe even cure them. And so the evolutionary focus just emphasizes that viruses that are really primary causes of cancer will have very specific characteristics. They've got characteristics that allow them to get into cells and to actually break down the barriers to cancer. Because those barriers to cancer by sort of complicated argument are also barriers for the virus's persistence inside of a cell. So the viruses evolve specifically to break down fundamental barriers of cancer. And so we can look at the genetics of those viruses and figure out whether they have those characteristics. So we can quickly focus on viruses that have exactly those characteristics that would make them uh, cancer-causing, which is really quite exciting. And the other point is that we now understand enough to recognize the modes of transmission of those of viruses that are cancer-causing. Turns out, mostly they're transmitted by sex and by kissing, which is kind of discouraging, right? I mean, if you'd prefer the, there'd be a transmission mode, you could really stop, right? But, and, and to some extent, they're also transmitted substantially, maybe secondarily, by um, blood-borne routes, so by intravenous drug use as well as contaminated blood. And that's something we can actually, especially contaminated blood, we can uh, screen for. Um, but although this is kind of discouraging that it turns out mostly they're transmitted by 
uh, sex and kissing, it's also empowering. So that um, we've got three viruses now that have been substantiated in study after study, but also um, called into question by some studies that haven't found these viruses, so it's still a little bit uncertain. But Epstein-Barr virus, everyone knows, is infectious mononucleosis virus transmitted by kissing, and also a little bit by sexual contact. Human papillomavirus transmitted by sexual contact. And then mouse mammary tumor virus, which is transmitted by secretions, probably salivary secretions in mice, and then gets into humans when we're exposed to mouse domesticus. At least that's what the data suggests. OK, um, time is up, so I have 30 seconds more, I guess. Um, at least, I, uh, okay, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. It um, was the kiss, uh, <laughs> right. But, but to, to me, why this is, uh, this is a little frustrating, it's also very empowering, because it suggests that um, individuals can make choices that actually reduce their chances of um, developing breast cancer, in addition to, in addition, you know, you're, you're, yeah, well, it's not like we're not going to have any sex. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of like, is that, that guy looks pretty cute if you're at a party, and then you remember what I've been talking about. Is it not cute enough? Right, that kind of thing. But, but also from the more formal scientific point of view, I think this is important because we, can, uh, we have the potential for anti-infective um, uh, ac actions and vaccines. And now I'm going to leave, and I'm going to tell you that uh, if... If those of you want to hear more about this, uh, we can, we're going to talk about it more at the workshop that's coming up afterwards. Thank you very much.